All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, let's, let's see. Uh, the reminders are going to be a big one. Um, if I should be aware of, uh, I'm expecting the first assignment tomorrow. I see some have been submitted here. I'm certain you're submitting the IPython notebook. Um, uh, the correct one, make certain, I'll uh, probably talk about some these some more today, but make certain that uh, it does run uh, all the cells from top to bottom, you know, so one thing before you submit, you uh, do a uh, uh, restart and everything. So I'll just do it real quickly as an example. So, you know, before you raise submit, you might want to do a um, kernel restart and clear all the outputs just to see that everything is unrun uh, and then do a run all or do the, uh, the, the, the restart all and rerun all the cells and just make certain that everything runs from the first one to the last one. So one of the first things I'll check is I'll, I will clear out all your outputs to the notebook that you submit and I will rerun everything. Um, so I look at what is actually running on my system. So. Um, so those are so looking for those tomorrow by five. Uh, we'll see. I think most people, um, I've had maybe one or two people I've been working with on getting some suitable Jupyter uh, Python environment up. Uh, hopefully that means that most everybody else uh, is good. I mean, if you don't have a, uh, if you're not running Jupyter notebooks yet, you're way behind. You've only got uh, uh, 24 hours before the first assignment. Um, 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 speaking about the environments, um, this is the environment that I'm using uh, right now. So uh, basically the Vagrant environment that I gave you should be pulling down, uh, if, I, if I did this right, it's pulling down, we're using Anaconda for our distribution. You can use that too, even if you're not using the, the virtual uh, environment that I give you, you can use Anaconda to install it locally on your system. Uh, if you're using that same version, you'll probably be good. You'll probably get the same versions of the libraries. This is what I'm getting, though, on the reference um, um, uh, environment that I'm going to be using for grading, right? Uh, you can check this yourself. You can just uh, run these yourself. Uh, take that and um, I'll create a new, um, a new notebook here. Just put those in. Um, of course, you know, your environment needs to have, for this first assignment, you should pretty much only be using uh, the basic Python system and then NumPy, Matplotlib, uh, and Pandas. You probably don't need, don't need to scikit-learn yet. But yeah, if you're using anything besides NumPy, Matplotlib, and Pandas, um, or the, the basic Python library, probably better check with me first. I don't know any reason why you would need anything else for this first assignment. Uh, and the other is you really should have these versions uh, or at least, or maybe higher versions. If you have lower versions, that's definitely a red flag. So if you run this on your environment, you need to have those libraries installed and you should have those, say just have it, those exact version numbers. So we're running 3.11 Python, 1.25 NumPy, 3.7 Matplotlib and so on. So those should be the numbers that, uh, that I showed here on the announcement. Oops. On the announcement um, that I just posted the other day. Um, so yeah, it's a, another thing that would be a good idea to check while you're working on the second assignment. Just convince yourself that uh, you've got suitable uh, environment um, where you're running your Python code, working on these things. All right. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to continue on. Um, uh, really, uh, probably most of all the, today, uh, we'll see if there's more questions about the first uh, assignment things. Uh, uh, maybe I can look at some of those a little bit deeper. Although, yeah, I don't know if I have a lot to say about that. So we could also uh, cover um, um, some other topics. So we, um, yeah, yeah. Before I get onto the the assignment, uh, maybe I want to talk one or two things about. Uh, we were talking a lot about NumPy last time. Maybe I can talk about a few of the other things that we we're supposed to be looking at this week. So, as a reminder, you know, uh, being this week, um, I'm kind of expecting that you 
uh, have learned the basics of NumPy, the Matplotlib, and the Pandas. So either using the lecture notebook or other uh, resources or both. Um, 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 I do have some lecture videos. I forgot about those of uh, uh, covering these same notebooks canned already. Um, um, yeah, you know, we're, we're not really using it yet, but uh, you also probably should make sure you have the, the hands-on machine learning textbook and have read through chapter one at this point, uh, which has some introductory stuff. So I'll be assuming that you know all the stuff in chapter one um, next week when we start talking about um, uh, getting more into actual machine learning things. So. Um, oh, uh, there was one more thing I wanted to, to mention. Um, I did find out um, that uh, uh, the the Matplotlib and the Pandas notebook were not running all the cells in my environment, so things change. Uh, as libraries come up. So, uh, but uh, yeah, now I'm gonna, I can't really remember exactly what it was um, in the uh, examples of drawing the figures. Or no, maybe it was the Seaborn, maybe the Matplotlib was okay, but the Seaborn. Uh, anyway, so I, I did actually fix some things, I, I think in the two, three and the two, four lecture notebooks. So if you ran them and things didn't run all the way, um, you should be able to do like a, if you just open up a terminal, um, that's going to be annoying. Oh, oh good. You can't see that up there. Can you? Um, uh, you should be able to do like a get pull, um, and pull them down. It won't work here. If, if it doesn't work in a terminal in, in uh, your Jupyter notebook, um, you should be able to open up a terminal on your host system and do the get pull. Um, you know, so I'm assuming, you know, you, in order to get the lecture notebooks and stuff, you shouldn't have Git installed, right? So if you want to, if you want to get the fixes that I just made, um, and you might want to periodically do that or do that before you work on um, a lecture notebook, try and pull stuff down, right? If you have changes to a notebook, that's fine, although you might get um, something about a, a conflict here. If you don't care about work you've been doing like in your own lecture notebook, you can always just delete it and do a git pull and it'll pull it back down. So for example, if I wanted to re make sure I pull down the version of the, um, the notebook that I'm talking about here, um, the, uh, the pandas one had one or two issues. The most recent version of pandas changed the API a little bit. If I just delete it, however you delete a file, so in the file browser, I just did from the command line, uh, if you do a git pull, it will re-pull that down uh, for you. Uh, whatever version is in the... Um, um, is, is in the repository, so I have to pull that down. Oh, um, actually, yeah. So if you're doing git from the command line, uh, you actually have to, uh, the git poll won't get it by default. You have to do like a restore. So if I do a restore on a file and I delete, um, we should um, pull down what are the, the version that I just pushed in. If, if you had local changes, you want to delete it. Make sure you get the one that I have. So little stuff about git that you have to know, but um There it is. Um, but yeah, I might occasionally do that, especially like, um, you know, don't work on assignment two yet. You can have assignment one working on or pretty much you've done at this point, hopefully, or at least have looked out all the way through it and, and been working on it. Uh, but but um, assignment two will have like another two weeks uh, after this one, or assignment might even be three weeks, I can't remember. Um, but uh, I might make, make some changes on that one, so you shouldn't. I shouldn't start on that one yet. Um, so if I do make some changes on that, you'll need to do like a get pulled or pull down the modifications. Um, all right. 
So um, yeah, I will talk specifically about some of the science stuff again, although I don't know if I have uh, a whole lot more to say about that, hints on that, unless I'll be happy if people have questions um, about specific questions on assignment two questions uh, that they've been working on uh, or, uh, or stuck on, or I'll go ahead and just open that up here. Assignment one. Um, but yeah, you know, um, I, last time, if you weren't here, you know, I, I, get, I did get quite a few hints on the first one, and the second one, uh, especially the second one, we talked a lot about uh, NumPy um, and some ideas, is, you know, I think the most complicated thing to, to, to um, repeat some of the stuff that we talked about last time is, is the idea of Boolean indexing or fancy indexing, right? So the simplest way to uh, do the latter part for the second question is to correctly understand how to create a Boolean index and then how to use that to select specific values from a NumPy array, but not only select them and modify them, but to, to change only those specific values. So to update a set of specific values that are selected by a Boolean mask. So those, those are kind of some of the hints that we talked about. If you understand that, um, then that's kind of what's being asked for, like this update of the values in Z is only supposed to happen for values that absolute value um, is greater than two or something like that, All right? So you shouldn't be doing this for the whole matrix, squaring it and adding in C, assigning it back in there. You should only be doing that for specific values in, in Z before you start this. Um, and the easiest way to do that is a Boolean mask. Um, All right, so there were, um, um, to finish off this week uh, in the stuff about Python and the Python scientific libraries, there were actually four notebooks. Um, uh, we only really talked about NumPy uh, library last time. Um, you, you need the matplotlib and the pandas. So the, the fourth question is about <laughs> pandas, uh, doing something with, with pandas. I'll talk about that a little bit here, maybe. Um, Seaborn, you, 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 if I didn't mention it before, um, I mean, you know, you can go through that, but you won't need that for the assignment anyway. Uh, that's more of an optional kind of thing this week. Um, you might, I might occasionally use Seaborn, um, but you probably won't need it for an assignment or anything. But Seaborn is just another uh, library of higher level visualization kinds of things. Um, So uh, let me just check. Yeah, I think this notebook should everything should run on the matplotlib except the very last one. Uh, the very last one won't run unless you actually have uh, the ffmpeg installed on your system to build movies. So another advantage of using the virtual environment is it is in Linux. It's very easy to install um, um, ffmpeg. Uh, in fact, maybe I'll just do that real quickly so I can try and run that. Um, so, uh, see if I can get that in there. So, uh, it's not installed by default in the virtual environment that I set up for you guys because it is kind of big. So, I'll just let that run, but um, so it might take some time depending on. Uh, all we've got here. So everything else, hopefully, in this notebook runs. Um, so to, uh, to to review a little bit some of the stuff that we talked about, we saw some examples of this. So um, uh, using NumPy, like we're doing here. Um, we can do operations, you know, uh, apply vectorized operations on collections of numbers. So this is the basic way we're going to be doing stuff in order to do numerical calculations. And 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 you know, scikit-learn and machine learning is is based on representing things usually as arrays, matrices, and numbers, um, and applying uh, different procedures to them in order to build models, of things, stuff like that. So at its simplest, you know, so, so we kind of use NumPy in order to do uh, you know, basic mathematical operations um, on discrete sets of points. 
So, um, so real quickly here, um, you know, if we create a set of, of points for our, you know, uh, for our functions that we want to uh, visualize here. So notice we're using a NumPy creation function to create, we end up with a one dimensional vector of values that go range from native pi to pi, there's only 256 in there, right? So if you actually look at the length of X here, or its shape, I'm gonna have to rerun the stuff here. Run everything above that. So, you know, um, all, all the, well, the, the lens space and the range function would give you that back there. So, in this case, we had 206 values. Um, and, you know, you should kind of realize kind of what's going to be in there. So, the, the value at index zero is going to be negative pi. Um, the value at the end of 255 would be positive pi. And everything else in between there is just uh, a linear increment. So, um, so, um, so these are quick examples, simple examples of vectorized operations. Again, so these functions are calculating the sine and the cosine, respectively, of all the values in that matrix. The result is um, so since we saved the result that comes back from this, I mean, we don't change X by calling these functions. It creates a new array with the results of the vectorized calculations, right? So both of these functions, uh, the resulting, the thing that's returned back, uh, have the same shape. So they're both vectors. Um, and I'm emphasizing that because that's that's I think I showed this last time, but that's the basic the basic plot works by you give it two things the the uh, the uh, independent variable so the x values are going to plot and then the result of that function so the, the y value so that is most basic uh, we can visualize the sign in our range that we specify from negative pi to pi calling that that plot the plot function right? like that. Just a basic sign function. Um, and we didn't specify anything else, so it's given us all the defaults. So it labels our axes, our x and y axes with appropriate things and, and displays everything. So um, I might have mentioned this before, I kind of skipped over this, but um, so we will usually, for examples in this class, and it's probably we should use it when we find stuff for assignments and the tests. Um, um, there, there's actually two different APIs. You can use a matplotlib, and one is kind of historical old one. Uh, the newer one uh, is in PyPlot sublibrary. It's kind of a more object-oriented API for plotting stuff. Probably one that's one that's encouraged to use um, uh, if you're uh, creating new uh, matplotlib plots. So, so by convention, you usually see it imported like that into a namespace PLT to do stuff with it. So we're using this uh, object-oriented based uh, API for matplotlib for this. And what I mean by that then is, um, um, so we plot the sine again and the cosine. That's our cosine function. Um, but um, uh, it's object-oriented in this sense that uh, whenever you do plot, it creates an actual object called figure object. And if you do subsequent calls to the plot library, it just modifies that. So it's not important in the sense that the figure object that's created uh, saves the state. And then you modify that state by calling other member functions of the that plot library, plot library, right? So here, when the first time I call plot, if I do it in the same cell, um, you know, it's implied that a figure object was created. And remember, then the second plot is going to modify the state of that figure. So the result is we get added. So, so we get the, the sine function first, um, and that ends up in the blue. Um, and the second one adds another plot element to the figure, which is the cosine. Um, so, so the, the orange-ish line uh, comes out um, also on the plot. Right. Um, And I'm sure I talk about these later on, but you can add in other um, elements. Um, uh, so, 
So for example, if I had labeled these items, Word. I don't know what's going on there. So if we label those elements, I'm sure we show example of this. Um, we can add in additional things like um, like a legend um, and so on. Um, okay. Oh, the, I mean, you know, uh, the, the whole basics of this, of the first part of the notebook is to introduce you to the basic concepts of what my father does. All right. So we're just trying to give you uh, an idea of how plotting, visualizing things works um, in the base matplotlib object oriented API. You know, so. Um, so what's kind of described here is that, you know, it's not shown, but it picks the defaults for a lot of stuff, right? So uh, here we actually end up creating the same figure that I had before, but we spell out a lot of the, the defaults explicitly, right? So stuff that it's doing for you um, is, you know, it's selecting a color, you know, so the first line is going to default to like the blue color, which is the C0. So we did here a second line, it's going to be this orange color, which is the C1 using this. Uh, defaults particular line widths. Uh, it uses a solid style by default, even though I have multiple um, functions that I'm plotting using lines here. Um, it determines the an appropriate range for the data. So it picks out the X range based on the, um, uh, the, the first value you didn't pass in the independent variable. Right? So since it, it ranges from mega pi to pi, you're going to see that the, the range of the x-axis is selected like that. So you can change your limit for the x-axis explicitly in your plots using functions you're calling like x limit. Uh, same for, for the y limit. So since sine and cosines always go from negative one to one, um, it selects those, but you can change your y limits. Um, you can change how the tick marks are labeled and things. Um, So yeah, the rest of these, I'll probably go through these relatively quickly, but the rest of these are just showing, you know, so if I want to change the thickness uh, and the color of the lines, I can specify different colors and different thicknesses. Um, if we want to improve this, this plot some, you know, so um, it might be better, the important values for this particular thing I'm trying to visualize um, on this trigonometric function, go from negative pi to pi, it might be better to use uh, actual um, tick marks that are fractions of pi, so negative pi, negative half pi. So we did that by specifying um, in our tick marks here, we passed in a range, but the range goes from negative pi to pi. Uh, and by specifying this, uh, it steps uh, by half pi's. Uh, so this one here, Specifically, you know, that doesn't make sense. Um, uh, look at the result of what you get by doing this range function here. Oops. So a range is a, another function, but basically the result is an array um, that goes up. You know, the first pi is negative pi, uh, and we're stepping in this range by values of pi over two. So take one half pi and go up, shoot go there. Um, and then of course, uh, so that's one half pi, and then that's one pi above that. So you end up at zero exactly on that and so on. A little tricky there, but uh, in order to, so A range doesn't include the endpoint. So if we don't tell it to go a little bit past that, it wouldn't include the, the last one there. So you know, sometimes you have to do little things like that for the, uh, for what you're doing, but without that, it goes up to, but doesn't include the last value. Um, and we really wanted to plot that on our tick marks on the last value. But yeah, so, so like X ticks, so this implies that basically X ticks takes in 
like an array or a sequence of values and you use that in your tick marks. Y ticks does the same thing. Um, Um, some further improvements. So, you know, um, um, if you're really visualizing some stuff, I mean, you know, we could have a whole course on visualizing data. Um, so, there's lots of things that are being implied here if you read through this notebook. Um, but, you know, always the, the, you know, so, so visualizations or figures uh, should tell a story, right? So, there's certain things you want to do in order to make it easy for. The, the person that you're trying to present the information to to be able to understand what's going on, right? So one thing in this class, you know, there's certain kind of things that um, are kind of hard rules. Like you should always include uh, labels for your X and Y axes, uh, which I didn't really do here, but, but also you should kind of pay attention to your tick marks and things that the values um, um, are useful for whatever you're trying to visualize or plot. Um, yeah, since so these are just basic trigonometric functions here. We don't really give a label for x and y axis, but you know, here we give an example of, um, of um, we can actually use a LaTeX markup um, to give more meaningful names for tick marks. Uh, so we'll show those symbolically using the symbol for pi um, for each of these. Um, and so on. the rest of these are just kind of more examples of things. You know, so so changing around how axes are displayed. Um, here, you know, we did show adding a legend. So the, the basic thing for a legend, um, the way that legends work, you know, that's another thing. If you do have a plot with multiple elements, you should almost always include a legend uh, describing what the elements are. So in this case, we're, we're still only plotting um, two basic things. Um, so we're still doing the plot of the sine here, but specifying a lot of stuff uh, in the cosine. But here uh, we add in another attribute, which is the label. So that if we want to generate a legend for our multiple elements in the plot, we get a legend, we get a, a key, an explanation of those plot elements. Right? So um, I showed this before, but in this case, again, we're showing using uh, LaTeX to uh, display our labels. And then later on, you know, we call legend, uh, have it go to a specific place. Um, so we get those um, labels for the blue and the red line of the sign of the coast. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's lots of other stuff you can do. So adding in some annotations or some text onto a plot. Um, All right, and uh, but but those are giving you some ideas about the yeah. So for assignments for this class, you probably don't you know. So here, when we're getting down to this, we're probably looking at uh, I've got a paper a figure that you can just go into like a paper for publication. So I, I really want to have you know a good story. I want to have all the elements um, labeled and, and uh, show other information. So highlight other information on the figure stuff like that. So you can do all that stuff with basic. Uh, Matt Plotlin, uh, Plotting Library. Um, Python has lots of different visualization libraries. So Matplotlib, most stuff is built on top of Matplotlib. So, but there are other ones like the Seaborn and um, some other things. I, I tend not to use the, the base Matplotlib system nowadays. I usually use something that's a little bit higher level if I need to create a, a real um, detailed figure for a publication or something or for a thesis or a research paper. Uh, but, um, you know, for the assignments for this class, um, you probably can just use the basic matplotlib plotting system. For the most part, you, I really just want you to label stuff, um, uh, make certain that your axes are labeled, um, and have legends for plot elements, things like that. I'll probably mention a couple of others. Um, yeah, and then what the second half is just uh, some more to give you some ideas of what you can do with the base um, plotting system. So, um, so um, I need to fix these things. It's a, uh, this is just another kind of um, um, 
uh, aside here, but it's always a good idea to pay attention. You know, don't just ignore warnings. I mean, you know, they may or may not be affecting you, uh, but, but try to understand it uh, to get uh, to make a determination. Is this something that's maybe giving me affecting me, giving bad results or not? So, uh, here, you know, again, the API is changing, so this style is going to go away at some point. So um, um, I should really fix these warnings. Um, so in the future, you're, uh, you got to explicitly say this is a style from the Seaborn Library. Did I mistype that? Oh, uh, actually, yeah, I probably just typed that. Should be like Seaborn uh, dash eight dash style. Don't like that. Um, but yeah, you'll run into warnings, especially when we get using scikit learn and stuff. So sometimes we'll talk about those when, when they come up. Sometimes it's warnings about convergence or other things, which are safe to ignore. Sometimes it's not, it's indicating a problem. So, um, so yeah, let's just go through these. So there's some exam, I mean, you, you can do fancy stuff if uh, you can see there's lots of code in these, but now, the basics of bar charts. Um, make this a little bit smaller. Um, bar charts with error bars. What else do we have in here? Bar charts and the other uh, orientation. Uh, bar charts with uh, uh, multiple. Um, Group bars. Um, so let me mention histograms. Uh, histogram is a fundamental chart type, or plot type uh, in Matplotlib. Um, uh, this is going to be important for us because the uh, in, in machine learning and statistics in general, the distribution of values um, in some uh, uh, feature or measurement uh, is important to know that'll affect the, the model that you want to build or something. So the most basic thing you can do to get a feel for how values are distributed for some feature is to, to plot a histogram, right? So in this case, um, um, uh, we've got, it's really just a made up, if you read through this notebook, it's really just a made up set of data randomly generated, but we've got things that are supposed to represent uh, I can't remember, uh, thousands of people or tens of thousands of people. Um, and so if you do a histogram, what it does is um, 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 if you don't specify, we specify 50 bins. So for the full range of weights for this population, so apparently weight range from just a couple of pounds for babies, it's a little bit above zero, can't really see, but range from there up to 350 pounds for an individual or a couple of individuals. Uh, but, but yeah, it breaks that up into 50 bins, right? So um, if, it, if it was like from 350 to zero, that means if it went all the way down to zero, if you just divide that by 50, that would be how much the width of each bin was. Right? So what is that, like six pounds? So, you know, so I'm describing that because you should understand it would be useful to understand this if you haven't seen this yet before. What these are, these are really doing kind of bar charts, but this represents the number of people. If each bin was, was a size of six, six pounds. So this, this represents that we have 150 people uh, in our data set had weights from zero to six. So that's just the count of the number of people that fell in that bin. The, like this bin here, this, this is something like from 200 to 206 or whatever, uh, 450 people approximately uh, were that way, right? But this gives us, uh, you know, this is the most basic step to give us an idea of how the distribution looks like, right? So for lots of data, you get a distribution that looks vaguely normal or you know, 
vaguely bell shaped, but not always. And uh, so sometimes if you have more than one peak or other things that can cause you problems if you're trying to do machine learning or do data analytics data. So you have to kind of know the shape of the distribution to do stuff with it. Um, another histogram, but with heights instead of weights. Yeah, and the rest of these are just showing you. So, um, so you can create on a single figure, you can have um, multiple plots using subplot command. So here we say we want uh, two rows and one column um, for this plot here. And then by calling, um, so this is the way it works for the matplotlib. If I want to create a figure with multiple plots on it. Um, so the first call to subplot defines the number of rows and columns. Uh, and then every subsequent call to, to, to subplot, uh, you specify which location, right? So, um, um, so, so the, the, the one here means that this is going to go probably on the top one here. Everything that happens after that ends up in this top one for the, uh, the first row. Uh, and then when we call subplot again, um, the rest of these, uh, the female height ends up at second one down there. Um, or, you know, here we're just we're doing the same thing like we did for the plotting the functions, but we just do histograms, but we do them on the same figure. So they're overlapping. You know? uh, I don't know. There's other things like to talk about, about visualization. So for example, we have an, um, uh, we're using alpha here as a common trick in visualization. If you have overlapping stuff, making them more or less transparent. So that you can still visualize or get a sense of uh, the, the stuff that's overlapped by one or the other. So without any alpha here, you wouldn't be able to tell uh, the one that's on top. You wouldn't be able to tell what the shape looked for the other one that was below it. But by making them a little bit transparent, you can still get a sense of the two distributions of the same ply. Um, yes, yeah, common thing, and uh, you learn about visualization. You might do. Um, um, a lot of our data will be doing stuff scatter plot. So actually, you know, one of the most fundamental things you can do if you're trying to figure out the relationship between uh, an independent variable and a dependent variable is just do a scatter plot. Um, so you know we might expect that there's a relationship between weight and height. And uh, this part is a notebook that's kind of leading up to some ideas. Our very first machine learning model we'll look at is fitting a line doing linear regression. So the most basic kind of linear regression you can do is I've got an independent variable, which is weight in this case, which we normally plot on the x-axis. And I want to I want to see I want to create a model that allows me to predict uh, what the height of the person is. So height would be the dependent variable in this case. Uh, height depends on, does height depend on weight? If it does, I can create a model so that if I add a person's weight, I can predict what their height is. The first step to building um, a linear regression model like that is you plot the data out there. And, and if if you think that there's, you know, so, so this vaguely might indicate that there's a relationship because things down here are in general smaller than things down here. So there seems to be a trend that, uh, that as weight increases, height increases which would make sense, right? Bigger people will tend to be heavier. Um, all right. Oh, and the other thing, I don't know if this will make sense, but um, if you're plotting raw actual data, always use like a scatter plot, so use plot points like we did here. And, and you'll have to do this for the second assignment. But if you're plotting um, something that's like a model, so, so what we do for a linear regression is we're going to create a line that, that, that's supposed to be a model of the relationship between the two variables. And when you plot your model, it's really a mathematical object. So it should be plotted as a line rather than as points or scattered plot points. Right? So uh, I'll probably repeat that many times, but um, um, you know, always when, when you're plotting raw data, it should be a scatter plot of points. Uh, and then um, 
and we have an example of doing a linear regression here. So a scatter plot, but where we use color uh, in order to show two different um, um, categories that we're plotting on the same plot here. But um, uh, here, well, we'll talk about linear regression, it's the most basic machine learning, machine learning kind of uh, thing that you can do with a set of data. So here, the raw data is the, the, the plot points. The linear model, the line that we fit to the data is shown as a line. This is the, the mathematical model that we would use if we have a particular weight to predict what their height might be um, with this linear regression. Um, so, um, yeah, so you might be interested in this. Uh, we're going to, we're going to spend two or three weeks talking about linear regression, logistic regression. So this is a preview of some of the stuff. So we're actually building, um, the, the linear model by hand using a function from NumPy called polyfit that actually creates this linear model. Uh, and then we plot it and we have some other stuff in here that we may or may not get to talk about where we actually um, display some of the uh, the, mar the error margin or the confidence interval um, um, for this linear model that we made in the data. Um, oh yeah, I thought there were more examples of this. So. Uh, and uh, you can do, um, more stuff, so I don't. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll be using this a little bit. Um, so um, um, you can make uh, contour plots and three D plots. I don't know if this is working or not. Um. Yeah. So there might be there might be an error um, on the example of three D plot, unfortunately. But yeah, you can do contour plots and three D plots. Um, and you can even make movies, assuming you got all the stuff installed that you need to make them. So I think my other library that was missing um, actually is installed now. So if you're using the virtual environment, you should be able to do that same thing if you want to create uh, movies um, using Matplotlib, just install the FFM library. Um, See if that run or not. There it goes. Um, all right. Yeah. Anyway, so those are some of the basics. In this class, you know, um, we will mostly be using the, the base net plot lens system for some basic type. Scatter plots and line plots, um, and maybe some histograms and things to see distributions of stuff. All right. Um, okay. So, um, although to tell you the truth, for this first assignment, you don't have to do a lot of plotting. But uh, um, uh, the other one that, that maybe we should talk about those pandas a little bit. So let's talk about that because uh, you do the the last fourth question does actually use some stuff. Using the library. Um, so, um, when Scikit-Learn was first created for Python, um, for the Python and scientific ecosystem of libraries, uh, we didn't really have pandas. So uh, one thing you'll find out is that Python, or sorry, that, that Scikit-Learn, we'll, we'll, we'll use Scikit-Learn probably the most in this class. It's a library for doing machine learning. Um, but Scikit-Learn, uh, you can use just regular NumPy arrays. But now Scikit-Learn also supports data frames, which are um, 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 a bit more of an advanced way of managing uh, a data set that you're going to uh, use, that you want to do some data analysis on or some sort of modeling like in machine learning on. Right? Um, so, and, and the, the data frame that Pandas gives you is, um, it really came from R. So if anybody knows what the R language is, R was built specifically for doing statistical analysis of data, data analytics kinds of things. 
And the fundamental thing in, in R is a data frame. So the data frame uh, here that Pandas gives uh, tries to replicate um, kind of the basic functionality of those sorts of data frames for doing data analytics tasks. So, um, so by convention, we usually use PD for Pandas in notebooks like these. Um, so, uh, I want to, well, let's see here. So, uh, there, there's two main kinds of things. There's actually a basic series, uh, and then there's the data frame. So, just to mention, so a series is really kind of like, um, uh, like an umpire array, but it's the vector of items. All the items in the series have to be of the same data type. Um, so here, this is just a, a series of, 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 of uh, ends up being floats, um, although you know we're, we're illustrating some things. So um, NumPy supports this as well. So missing values and things can be put into NumPy arrays and can be indicated using different things. So in NumPy, the NAN is usually used to indicate like a missing value. We'll have to talk about that. So that's a big problem in machine learning and data analytics. What do you do with values that are missing um, in a data set here? So uh, anyway, I mean, you know, even though we've got a missing number here, for the most part, uh, this should remind you of like vector in uh, NumPy, you know, so it's really, uh, there is some extra stuff, but it's really just a, a one-dimensional set of numbers that are, the type is really float here. It's what they end up being. Um, so, so we get a data type float with six numbers in it. Um, and we'll, we'll have to come back to this, but um, you know, series and also data frames, you can slice them in similar ways. So what we, we saw for, for NumPy arrays, so uh, for basic series, you can index them, get the first item or the last item or any particular item. So if I want to get the item, um, the NAN, which is at index three, you can use that. Uh, but you can also use the slicing kind of stuff. So I can get just the first three values or I can get the value excluding the first one, but every other one, so the first, third, and fifth value in there. Notice though, so one thing, I'm probably skipping ahead a little bit, but uh, every time, for a series or a data frame, every row gets an index or a sequence number assigned to it, uh, which NumPy doesn't really have that for basic arrays as an idea. So, well, you see, if you don't specify the index, it will create an index for you, uh, which, which will be useful in some contexts. So, for our basic one, if we didn't specify it by hand, uh, it just indexed those numbers from zero to five for our um, series of numbers. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, the reason why we start with a series is one way to get to the data frame is really just a sequence, a collection of named series. That's one way to visualize it. The other way that I think about uh, a data frame is it's really just a, a table. It's a representation of a table, like a table you might have in a database. So that's probably the the the. Um, the, the most common example that people have. So if you create uh, a data frame, I'll we'll come back and talk about the creation here, but if we create a data frame of just kind of made of data, you can display it and get the result like this, right? So what it's meant to represent is we end up with three or four rows of data in here. Um, and we've got, um, one, two, three, we've got six features in this data frame, right? So the names of each column is what we'll refer to as the feature name, um, uh, for, for the data, um, right? So each each feature or each measurement for another name that affects the data. As you think of each row is gonna be like a participant in your experiment. There's gonna be something where you're gonna make measurements. And then each column is a different measurement. Uh, um, so uh, like in psychology, which is an area that I'm relatively familiar with, if I'm writing experiments, I might recruit 10 subjects. So I have a row of each of 10 subjects, and then I have columns for each of the things I measure when they do my experiment. So I might get their name and their age. I think that, that those might be useful in my model, but I might have them run um, a beta 
they're going to record their reaction times or how fast they react to something. So I might have a column of reaction times for um, pressing a button on something, something like that, right? So that's typical for the data that we want to analyze and the data we want to make models of the machine learning. Um, so we'll represent a table. Each row is a measurement, like the participant in the experiment. Each column is a different fe feature. So I said that wrong. Each, each row is a, a different um, um, uh, a different participant or a different collection of like an experiment. Right? So if I have multiple participants that I recruit, uh, I'm running the same experiment, but I'm doing it multiple times. In, um, in each and then each column is the data that we collected running that experiment on that particular uh, participant. So that's the most common way that we think about. So that's what we're representing here in a data frame. So unlike an array in NumPy, we can have columns, we can have data, you know, the series um, be a different data type. So we have a date here, and we have um, something that's like an enumerated type testing train. So our named column B here, um, um, we, we started off and then we, uh, with, uh, integer values, um, and then we change it into categorical, so the enumerated or a categorical data type. I'll talk more about these concepts here. So in pandas, these are called categorical. Whenever you have uh, something where you have um, a constrained uh, list of, um, of values, so we only have two values in this category, either it's train or test. Um, we got strings. Um, so notice some other things here. I mean, we won't be creating dictionaries like this again. You know, what we normally do in machine learning is you've got data set in the database or in a flat file, some sort of value file data. You load that in. Uh, so you load the data in from some source, but often we'll load it into a data frame um, like we're doing here, and especially if we want to keep. The height of our columns, you know, we've got things that aren't simple numeric values, dates, or uh, strings, or other stuff that we need to keep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so, so we won't do a lot of creating fiction, uh, creating data frames by hand like we did here. So, one way you can create a data frame is you can pass in a dictionary. Remember, uh, we talked a little bit about dictionaries. So, notice what's happening here. Um, um, this is really just a dictionary. The key is A, B, C, D. Uh, I don't know why we skipped E, A, A B, C, D, F, G. Um, so that's just the key for each other. We, we've got six separate dictionaries here, right? Um, actually, we end up with seven because we first create D with just integers and then we uh, re change it into a categorical um, data set. Uh, oh yeah. So anyway, then the values um, are in some cases it's just a single value. So G has a single value of foo. Other times it's a series, right? So basically, the the, the one that's the longest series is gonna it, the way that we're creating it here is gonna determine how many rows we have. Um. So um. So I don't know if this is worth understanding at this point, but like the reason why this works, like A and G only have a single value. So if you don't have enough for whatever the largest one is, it'll do something to impute or figure out the value. So it ends up just repeating the one and the foo for those cases. All the others probably have four values. It uses the four values that you give in the, in the sequence for those named uh, series, those named the columns in the data. Um, all right, so, yeah. Once you create a data frame, you do lots of stuff with them. Um, so they're very powerful, high level way of manipulating data and doing data analysis. Uh, you can figure out which features, or what are the columns in the data frame. Um, we just use the default index or everything got an index starting at zero. That's not really part of the data. That's just a, a unique number that identifies each, um, uh, each participant. So each set of measurements that we have in our, in our data frame here. Um, the types for each of our feature. So we ended up with floats, dates, 
um, our categorical var variable in um, a feature called D uh, objects. So things that are strings, will, that's kind of the most generic. I think if, if pandas or numpy can't figure out how to convert um, you know, something into uh, a more specific data type and look at this generic object, which is just a sequence of, of um, bytes, basically, of memory. And so strings often need to be represented as objects in NumPy um, or uh, pandas if we can't figure out specifically that it's, you know, an integer or a float or a date or something. Um, So you can actually create more complex kind of shaped data frames, but pretty much in this class, we'll almost always be using tables, so rows and columns. So, so like two tables, two 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 dimensions, um, um, of which right, um, you need to know the number of rows or columns or probably other other ways to get it. But but yeah, the shape like you know some of this is pretty similar, the same as NumPy arrays. Um, this is telling us that. For my two dimensions, I got four rows, so I've got four different participants or uh, experiments that were run, and I've got six features, six uh, different types of measurements that we collected for each one of our participants. Um, so, um, oh, and by the way, so um, we'll probably use this, but then you can convert. Uh, so, if I get learned in some context, you have to pass the number. You have to actually pass the thing. Uh, um, of, of numeric values, floats or integers. So there's a very useful thing that data frames do. You can just ask for the values, um, and it might not look like it. But well, I mean, this is a NumPy array, right? so so we actually got a NumPy array here. Um, um, as a result, everything is represented as an object, though, because they couldn't figure out how to convert some of these into integers or something. So you end up with the the the, the type is that generic object. Kind of thing, but um, but it really is a NumPy array. So um, um, so some there is still something where you can't you can't pass the data first get it into a NumPy array because uh, it's going to expect a NumPy array. You can just use the values attribute of a data frame to get the corresponding um, NumPy array to do stuff with it. All right. Um, so, let's see, what was the point of this here? Oh, um, yeah. Real quickly, then, you know, uh, besides the indexing that we saw for uh, NumPy arrays, so one, of the, one of the main things when you're working with data is that the names of the Feature that you um, measure, so the names of the measurement would be very helpful. So, really, when you create a data frame, um, these column names uh, are very useful um, to manipulate, you know, to do data analysis instead of using index 0, 1, 2, 3, like that's the upper number, right? So, um, most of the time, um, I can refer to stuff um, in data frames using those. Column name. So, right, if I just want feature B, column name B, I can get that. Uh, this is from the original one. Um, or, or F, I can get that. Um, and I'm sure this is shown below here, but you can also use um, some, something that looks like indexing not notation. Right, so this is equivalent to doing, uh, to just pulling off um, um, column A from DF. So, so you might see examples use it like that instead. Right? So, but no, instead of passing in the index, we're passing in the name of the column. Data frame, I can give it a name of the column either as a attribute using dot or um, as the column name as as a string basically um, to, to get just that feature. Um, So um, I guess actually already later than I thought. So let's uh, how much more we got here. Uh, 
Um, so a lot of the stuff that after this point is stuff you have to do for the fourth question. You know, so I ask you to do some things like display the first five values. I give you some like head for that or the first 10 values by specifying how many values you want. So here in this diagram, I kind of forgotten about it, but uh, what did we do here? So um, we're actually using, so here we're using something more than just the integers for the index. Um, so when we create this data frame, we specified that the index are dates, um, and then we create a lot of columns of, of uh, so a lot of features of random data here. Um, so um, these end up being all of our column names. Um, and the, the data is just um, a bunch of uh, random numbers here. Um, so 60 rows by 26 columns. So we've got uh, that much kind of randomly generated data it's just coming in from here. So, um, so one of the first things you do if you're doing data analysis or analyzing a new data set, you have to get a feel for what's in there. Uh, so you might just start by looking at like the first couple of values, the last couple of values, right? It's to get a feel for which, what, what kinds of columns you have, so what kind of features you have, what are the values in the features, um, whether stuff is missing or not, what the ranges of the data are. Um, so, um, so yeah, you can either use values or to NumPy. So I think they do the equivalent thing. One Pi calls the other. In, uh, the, in pandas. Um, okay, um, and um, so um, I think you have to do a little bit of this for the fourth question. So um, I already mentioned a little bit of this. Uh, you can select uh, data from data frames uh, using indexing. Um, so I can get the first three rows using a slice. So if you don't specify which features you want, uh, it'll default to rows if you do this. So this is the same as doing like head three, if you do this. Uh, I already showed this. So you can use the name of the column um, to select a particular column or feature of a data set, get the seeth one uh, using that or using the, the, the dot C syntax there. Um, so kind of like fancy indexing, you can pass in like a list or a sequence and get multiple columns. Right? So you do the same thing with NumPy arrays using a list of indexes. We talked a little bit about that. So here, um, um, if we want the three particular columns, DQP, we can pass in a list with those columns we want. That will select out only those three columns. Right? Um, here you do have to use the, the uh, and notice, I mean, the reason why it's double square brackets is the one bracket means it's a list. So if it's clear, we could have done something like say, um, um, created the list separately. Uh, they should be equivalent. So I'm just creating a regular list value, a regular Python list with three strings in it. But I pass that list in, um, and it will should select those um, um, same way. Right, so that's all that's happening there. Um, of course, if you want multiple col columns by name, multiple features by name, uh, you can't use that dot notation. So I can't do something like that because you don't. You can only get one at a time using that number or that dot notation. Um, feature. And if you need more than one, you, you have to use. Um, um, this to pass in the list of the features that you want to select out. So. Um, so, um, like we did for NumPy arrays, you might want to, instead of selecting particular columns, um, or so you might want to select uh, particular columns using indexes instead of using the name, right? 
Um, really, actually, if you find yourself wanting to do this, you might want to take a step back because data frames are meant to be used. You're meant to use the, the, the name feature, right? So if you start trying to index columns by by index, um, you know, try to pull stuff out by the, the column index, you're probably missing a lot easier way of doing it. Right. But but an actual thing, if you, if you know how to use NumPy arrays, you might say, okay, um, so this is a two-dimensional data frame. Uh, I, I just want the first three columns, you know, column zero, one, and two. Right. Um, but um, um, yeah, yeah, you can't really do that. But there is a thing built, and I don't know if you have to do this for the, for the, for the, for the assignment for tomorrow. Uh, but you can, if you need to, get down to using indexes. Uh, if you use iloc, uh, so iloc will allow you to, for iloc, you have to give always uh, numerical indexes for rows and columns. But then if you use iloc, you can do kind of the same thing you do with NumPy. So like I was trying to do there, uh, this gets all rows. This is the first one before the comma, it's the full one, and ends up selecting all rows in the slice, but we only get the first three columns in our second dimension um, for the data frame. Right. Um, so that, that should be the same things that it, uh, that we did uh, this way uh, using a list of features. Right. So by default, this one will get you all the rows, but just those features that you specify. Um, but yeah, again, I think there are better ways of doing this, but um, um, if I really only needed some particular rows and particular features both at the same time. I only want the first five rows uh, and just the last three features here. So again, I'm using slicing notation. Uh, so the negative three means from three from the end. So it should be the last three features. So X, Y, Z. Another good thing to do when you're, if you run these notebooks, what you should do, you know, you shouldn't just read them. Uh, try and clear out everything and predict what you think you sh what what will be the result of running something instead of running it and then looking at the result. Right? So if you're right on your prediction, you're understanding stuff. It surprised you when you ran it. You didn't have any work. You couldn't figure out what you're expecting to see. You're missing something. You might want to go back and review things or slow down a bit. Um, so yeah, that was the, the first four rows, but just the last three data values in there. Um, So um, um, we're just selecting by the index here. So we're actually, um, oh no, yeah, I don't let's see. I don't know. What else? I'm not certain which of these you might use. So there's lots of other examples of, of things here. So um, yeah, here we're slicing out uh, some particular dates. Uh, and only getting those rows. Um, but uh, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and uh, have too much time here. So what else should we uh, make certain? Let's look here. So yeah, there's other more, but I don't know how much of this we'll end up using. Um, uh, um, I mean, you can add and remove. Uh, you you have to do this for the, the fourth question. So you know, um, you know so one of the basic things to do is, um, um, or, and you can rearrange stuff. So so yeah, I mean here, um, by uh, what we're doing here is we're creating a list. So so we're actually we're not really. Uh, rearranging stuff in the original data frame. So we, we, we create a list of all of the, the original columns. We, we take out two values. So the remove is actually just working on a regular Python list here. We take out those two values, but then we create a new list where we put them back at the front, right? So here, this is doing what we showed before. We're just using passing in a list. So that gets the values, but passing a list, it gets the values in that order that we now have them in there. 
Uh, and then finally we end up creating the new new data frame by so by assigning that back in there now the data frame the, re the result of that is that we rearrange the columns right so we end up we, we pulled m and x out put them at the front and everything else had the thing you can do same kind of things if you need to rearrange you can you can do that to drop columns um, although if we talk about it, but you can add columns drop columns um um let, let's look at that so um uh, although I might have to run the stuff here. So um, so this will be the kind of final stuff that I'll look at. So um, so here we've got a data frame that has this data in it right now. So we did some things to, um, I don't remember what we were doing there, but um, so we've got, um, Put a date in here. So, for example, you know, we've only got three um, attributes for three columns in this data frame. So, we can create like a new column easily just by. Um, um, so, here, if we assign something into a feature, so you can do assignments into that notation as well. That will create a column. In this case, assign a simple five will just repeat the value uh, for however many number of measurements that I have. Right. Um, um, another example, if, if you add in like a, a list of values, you have to have the number of values. So, you know, if you only give it one, it'll repeat it. Um, if I want to give, if I have a new set of values, if, if, if I've got 10 rows, which is what I probably have here, if I want to add another uh, column called values, uh, and they're all different, I have to have 10 values, or else you get an error. You try and add it in like that, but that that one should add a second column called values with the, the 10 values from one to 10 or zero to nine. Um, and here we're, we're giving an example of adding uh, another categorical column in here. So, you know, the result of that from the original, we added all we added three different types of columns uh, in here. Um, You can change specific values. So here, the uh, the last row uh, uses iloc. So again, remember that's using indexing strictly to access particular values in our table here. Uh, the last row, the, the, the first column, the zeroth column, we're setting to zero. So you can always do that to modify a particular value. Um, and we showed kind of uh, creating a new row. Uh, but you can use that to to change like a whole like row, um, other stuff like that. So, so here we, we select a range of rows um, and change the cat to be two, right? So so um, the result of that should be just those rows that were selected should end up being two here, I think. And it ends up being only one row that gets modified by that. So only one has a date between those two dates um, in that slice there. Uh, another that can be very useful uh, if we're doing data analysis, um, uh, oftentimes you have to derive some feature as a combination of other features. So um, here are the original values, we have a complex formula. So what we might really need to create a model from is take the original values, square them. Um, so basically we're, we're applying a quadratic uh, formula to those original values um, and putting it back in there. So from the original, we, we could have done that. Um, so here we just overwrite the original values. Uh, so now actually I've got these values in here. Um, 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 or kind of as a final thing, um, I could have um, we could have put this into a new one so um, like that so, so so in the second version I did for that um, I, I kept around the old values that we calculated the new feature from 
still in values, um, but then we, we're adding in like a new column, uh, the quadratic image. So um, yeah, I've, I've ran out of time here. Um, sorry about that. So it's forty-five. So we'll go ahead and stop there. I, I think you know we've pretty much a. Um, uh, there's one or two other things like maybe like I think the last thing you have to do for question four is create a graph, a figure from the data frame. So there's some examples in the notebook of doing that. So. All right. So yeah, let's adjourn there for today. Uh, let you guys go. I can stick around for a few minutes. I, reminder: I have office hours after this as well over in my. Uh, in Science 355. So if, if still, if you have some specific questions, uh, you can walk with me over there if you have some time. So. Otherwise, that's it. See you guys next week. Make sure you get your assignments in. So, all right. Uh,